We are looking forward our way from Studio C in the 511 Studios. That's in the Brewery District, just south of downtown Columbus, Ohio. Hi, this is Brett. Uh, Carol and I each drove to the studio today. However, many in our community do not have personal transportation, access to convenient public transportation, or not able to utilize public transportation due to health considerations. Today, we welcome our guest, Emma Strange, Mobility Coordinator for the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission. You've probably heard of it as their acronym, MORPSI. Although MORPSI staff have been with us several times, this is Emma's first studio visit. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Emma, thank you for coming to see us today. Your time and expertise is what we're looking for, so we really thank you for that. You know, transportation is an important topic to cover in our communities. Even though Central Ohio is growing and prospering, our transportation issues are huge. Before we dive into MORPSI and the Regional Mobility Project, though, let's hear from about you. Give us your background and the career journey you've taken to get you to MORPSI. Sure. So I um, am not a planner. It's kind of like the um, disclaimer I give whenever I talk about like why I'm doing at MORPSI. Um, I actually come from a social work background. I grew up in North Carolina, um, and in undergrad, I worked as a volunteer coordinator, um, and all of my volunteers were mostly older adults and people around my age, so like 18 to 22. Um, and I loved working kind of in the intergenerational space. I love to see the exchange, and I learned so much from my directors who were um, women in their 60s and 70s, and I just realized how important it was that all of our efforts were intergenerational and not just like siloed. And then pandemic hit, right? And I was like, okay, I have a degree in anthropology. I really need to be employable. I should probably go (laughs) and get something that's employable. And um, I thought, oh, social work and older adults. I could really do this. And in the pandemic, you were hearing a lot of language around um, that was really ageist and really dismissing Mm -hmm. older adults because that was the population that was, and disabled people, these were the populations that were most um, dismissed during COVID. And that was really impactful for me to hear, you know, people my age dismiss people with disabilities, dismiss older adults um, because of the pandemic. Um, And so I went into get my social work degree and I worked in housing and foreclosure and eviction prevention for seniors. Um, did some case management and like, lo and behold, number one barrier aside from housing was transportation. Mm -hmm. How do you get a client to come see you when they can't pay for an Uber and they can't drive? Um, So then I was searching for jobs and I was in Ann Arbor at this time and I had never been, (laughs) I've never lived in Ohio before, but um I saw a mobility coordinator and I thought, okay, I think I could maybe try this. Um, I started and not knowing much about planning, um, but everybody was very supportive and helpful and making me understand like, okay, this is what a plan is. This is what a planning commission does. I still consider myself very much like a lay person um, in some of those aspects, but because we have such a great team, I'm able to lean on them. Um, And it's really, my social work experience in the planning has really melded very well. Um, I've really liked seeing how those two things intersect, the macro social work and then the larger planning aspect. So a very long journey, a very long way to say a long journey. Mm -hmm. But well, first I have to thank you for being appreciative of those of us who are well into and past our careers (laughs) that you, (laughs) that you had, we had words of wisdom. Some of your colleagues were giving you good information and um, a good network for you to learn your job. So thank you for appreciating us older folks. Um, but also what great insight on ageism during COVID. We saw that um, older adults and the disabled were most at risk of getting COVID and spreading it. And so they were dismissed. And we saw many, many cases in our families and friends of where older adults really suffered because of that. So good for you. Thank you very much for working through all of that. Even though she did go to school in that state up north. state up north, yeah, exactly. I did, and then I came down here. I always do the disclaimer of like, I only was there for a year and a half. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. You learned learned the the lesson. But, but, you know, um, that's that 
school up north has an incredible anthropology program. Mm -hmm. And I actually looked at that for grad school. Okay. Actually, I actually did get my anthropology program in um, in Boone, North Carolina. Okay. So I went to Appalachian State University, which beat Michigan in football in 2007. Yay. And they're not letting anybody forget it. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I loved my time in Boone. So, yeah, just a, I, like, made my way, like, halfway down from the south. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That, that works out. But But anthropology gives you a great background in research in data collection, in analytic thinking that I would think mm -hmm. would be is key and critical for you in this job in mobility. Oh, I my anthropology degree I think is probably like the I mean my MSW is also important, but that anthropology degree I feel like is so valuable and I know I made a joke like I'm not going to get a job with an anthropology degree. I use it every day. Right. Um mm -hmm. especially when you take into consideration like that qualitative data versus quantitative right. like right. when you think about like the value of lived experience, especially even in planning, like the, I wish I could do like an ethnography of like mm -hmm. older adults, like trying to get to the grocery store and like doing their daily trips, you know, because right. it it really is that, that lived experience that anthropology, at least my program emphasized that I use every day. Um, so Good shout for out you. anthropology. Yeah. Good for you. So as, a, as an old career counselor, my message is, Whatever your degree is in, it's going to help you build skills yeah. to use in the next in the next path. So good for you. Yeah. Well, we've had uh, a couple of previous episodes talking about how uh, with 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 Morphsy, uh, how communities cannot grow successfully without careful planning. And we've kind of gone into depth about, you know, we kind of see the fruits of all that planning that happened years prior. Uh, and, you know, that planning model has grown to encompass the value of regional decision making. Can you give the audience an overview of what role Morpsey plays in this planning and how they work with other similar organizations around Ohio and the nation? Yes. Uh, now that I have a year under my belt at Morpsey, I feel like qualified. I've done this answer so many times. I'm like, I can totally do this. So um, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission um, is a regional council. So that means that we have um, partners um, and communities that we serve. That's over 80 uh Local governments and community partners, we provide three main services, so nonpartisan data analysis, long-range planning, and community resources. I typically fall underneath that, like, community resources um, umbrella. Um, and what we do is um, look at growth in our areas and try to learn creative ways to accommodate it, so housing, development, transportation, um, and help communities plan for a growth that's going to be sustainable as well um, and for our environment and also for the residents too. Uh, we're one of 24 regional councils in Ohio, um, but there are also national, there are um, regional councils all over the mm -hmm. country. Um, we do a lot of work with other um, regional councils in Ohio. I know that I do too. I um, The regional mobility plan is not like a unique, it's unique, but there are other regional plans like it, um, headed up by MVRPC, Omega, um, and a couple others that are being written. Um, so I definitely work with them. You don't feel well. alone. No, <laughs> thankfully. Um, and I totally, when I started it, I was I was asking them all the time. I was like, how do you guys do yours? <laughs> and, um, you know, so beyond just Morpsey, there was a lot of... Yeah. There's a lot of support and a lot of interest in regional planning um, for older adults and mobility. Mm -hmm. I think that our community is finding a lot of success because we are not only looking at things regionally as opposed to looking at what Columbus does, what Upper Arlington does, what Delaware County will do, but looking at it a bigger picture. But also Morpsey brings in that creativity, not just because you have an incredible staff of brilliant people working on this, but also because you have that, um, those paths to people all literally all over the country, you know, to help you do that. So we want to talk about this plan. So what is it? How is it developed? What are the goals and the visions? Okay. So the regional mobility plan, um, there's like a very long name for it too. It's, um, it's the coordinated plan for Ohio Department of Transportation's Human Service Transportation Coordination Region 6. 
<laughs> so sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah, um, of course. Of course. <laughs> so our yeah. our Ohio Department of Transportation has divided um, Ohio's counties into these regions for human services transportation. Um, and these regions are actually based off of, if you know the Area Agency on Aging, mm-hmm. they also have regions. Mm-hmm. So ODOT's human service regions are based off of those AAA regions. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. And it's perfect for like that, for the exact purpose of like, mm-hmm. we focus on older adults and people with disabilities. So it allows for better coordination. So essentially, CO AAA's region, um, Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging. I'm big against acronyms, so I'm going to try to use them as less we, as I we can. We use CO AAA a lot here. <laughs> okay, so good, it's okay, good. It's okay. Um, but they we overlap pretty much right on top of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, the Regional Mobility Plan does add Logan County, but like other than that, we map right on top of each other. Um, and that's kind of like the idea is that we're focusing on getting. It's focused on older adults and people with disabilities, not exclusively, but um, it is fun. I will get to the funding source, but it is um, the funding does focus on that population. And we're trying to get people across county lines um, okay. because I think that, like you said, like we don't want people to be siloed necessarily. Right. And we want there to be greater collaboration between these um, counties. The Regional Mobility Plan um, was written in 2022 um, and it identifies needs and desires of people with disabilities, older adults, and also other groups that are typically disadvantaged by transportation options. Um, So that could be new Americans, that could be low-income populations. Um, And it is a large area. It's nine counties um, that are covered in it. I'm going to name them, and I think I'm going to do it alphabetically too. Um, Delaware, Fairfield, Fayette, Franklin, Licking, Logan, Madison, Pickaway, and Union. Very good. So those are all of the counties that work together on this um, plan. And if you know anything about these counties, you know they're very, very different. Um, so what regional plans allow for is that each of these counties has their own local goals and strategies already. And then we all have regional goals that we work on together. We want we don't want to sacrifice like the autonomy and the uniqueness of each county for the idea of a regional goal. We can have both. We can have both the overarching like goal of getting people across those county lines while also understanding that what Logan County needs is going to be different than what Franklin County needs. Um, We want to have a future where people's lives don't end at the county line. Your doctor's appointment isn't always going to fall very neatly within Franklin County. Um, And this was developed with input from mobility managers, um, transportation agencies, the public, surveys, local governments, um, uh, there was a public comment period, and this is also updated yearly. So there's a yearly survey. Our last one was done in the summer of 23. We'll do one in likely the fall of 24. Um, and the mobility managers also consistently get feedback too, because we all have we have local um, committees in each county um, also focused on it. Well, that's uh, obviously you're describing a huge plan here, a huge undertaking. Uh, each county in the region served by a mobility, a, a mobility manager, as you mentioned. But can you give us a glimpse of their responsibilities and how um, it's actually funded, too? Yes. I love talking about mobility managers because okay. Ohio has a very, very unique mobility management um, program. And so mobility manager is actually a nationwide project um, that can be funded by federal dollars. The federal grant is called 5310 Enhanced Mobility for Seniors and Individuals with Disabilities. This grant is meant to exceed um, the requirements set by the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and is supposed to go above and beyond for connecting um, older adults and people with disabilities to public transportation, as well as like provide alternatives to public transportation, get people around. And mobility managers are kind of a project type. Um, and Ohio is unique because we have over 60 counties represented that have a mobility manager. Um, that is more than any other state in the country by a lot. Um, the fact that we have over 60 counties with a mobility manager. Um, and these mobility managers, we meet at least once a month um, virtually and then quarterly we're meeting um, in person. Um, mobility managers kind of have... Two, I like to like put it in two buckets. Like the first bucket is going to be the individual bucket. 
uh, that's going to be your travel training, um, your informa- your very typical like information and referral, like calling me and saying, hi, Emma, I'm trying to get from X to Z. Like, what should I use? And I'll help you figure out what the best option is. Or it's the very uh, in-depth, individualized, like transportation planning. Like, um, let's say like you have a new diagnosis and you're thinking that you won't be able to drive anymore. Well, like, let's have a long talk about like what, we're, how you're going to get to all of your destinations. And then that second bucket is going to be like that community bucket. So, for example, in the regional mobility plan, each county has their local goals and strategies. The mobility manager is kind of the one responsible for those, um, making sure that they have a committee focused on accomplishing those goals and strategies. Um, They're also the ones that are going to be out in the community doing community presentations, soliciting feedback, trying to listen to the community and know what, um, what is needed. And being that expert in the room, mm-hmm. like that that advocate for senior needs, that advocate for disability needs, when they're in a room full of um, planners or in a transit agency, that's kind of like the role that they are supposed to play. Um, and yeah, we're just very, I think we're very lucky to have, um, you know, a Department of Transportation that has elevated this so much and has pushed it so much. Um in Region 6, so in in the regional mobility plan here, uh, currently eight of our nine counties have a mobility manager. Um, there isn't one in Madison County quite yet. We're hoping soon. Um, but, yeah, it's a very extensive network. It sounds like you have a place at the table then to speak mm-hmm. whenever there's a table to be to speaking at. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well, that's good. Okay. Well, it, and because the information is so intense and um, – it's not something you can just Google and find. It's really information that they do need the expert at the table. But you you said there are 60 mobility managers for 60 counties. We have 88 counties in Ohio. What happened to the other 28? Do they Are they not represented at the table? So in order to have a mobility manager, you need to have an agency go and apply for that $5310. Right. Um, so if you are currently in a county that does not have a mobility manager, you can find that out by going on ODOT's website. They have a map of every county in Ohio, and then you can see they have, like, the colored ones, and it literally has, like, the mobility manager's name. So, like, when you go to Franklin County, it says, I'm a strange. <laughs> um, and if you have a county that doesn't have a mobility manager, then some agency, you know, go find a way to get a mobility manager in your county because there is – I think always going to be a need there. Um, And I think that ODOT's done a great job of kind of promoting the program. Um, And we do other things to try to make sure that they're included. Mobility managers will still stay involved in like the neighboring counties because you kind of have to be. Again, Mm -hmm. like we know people are trying to get cross county. But yeah, I would love for all 88 counties to have a mobility manager. I I mean, Madison County with London, that's a Mm -hmm. significant city in our area. Yeah. And uh, you would think that I'm going to dump this on the county commissioner's lap, but you would think that the commissioners would make sure that's taken care of. But as you said, if there's not an agency to house that person, mm-hmm. yeah. that it may not be possible. I, I'm I'm assuming that a county commissioner's office cannot house the mobility manager. Uh, a government agency can, um, or a nonprofit. Those are the two okay, that are able non-profit. to um, apply for a mobility manager position, um, and. Bridges Community Action Partner has applied for the mobility manager position um, and will be hiring one. Um, So we will have a fully staffed one, which is really, really great. Um, The executive director, Andrew Benninger, there has been a very huge um, support for mobility managers. Are the counties that are missing mobility managers, do they tend to be more rural counties? Honestly, I think that... um, Sometimes I'm trying to think off the top of my head that either Cleveland or Cincinnati don't have one either. Because really? I think sometimes you think like, oh, it's such a big city. You're not going to need a mobility manager, you know, because there must be so many resources, you know. Like, I think that's the assumption for Columbus. A lot of the time it's like, it's Columbus. Of course, everyone can get to where they're going. Like, it's a big city. I think that that's even that's kind of a misconception that like rural counties are the only ones that are mm-hmm. underserved. Like urban counties also have a lot of unmet needs and do also need mobility managers. I mean, I had just assumed you were going to say yes to my question. That it was all <laughs> rural counties. So, yeah, if a large city doesn't have one, I, 
one of the things we were talking around at the table before we started the podcast, my neighbors on jury duty from Delaware County to downtown Columbus, parking mm-hmm. is tough because of all the construction around the federal building. And she looked at, on Uber to see how much it would cost, and it's $50 each way. Yeah. That's not easy, accessible, affordable transportation. And yeah. there's no way she could be downtown from Delaware County by 7.30 in the morning. Yeah, and it's oftentimes like the the $50, the $200 that's standing in the way between you and a very important medical appointment. Right. Sometimes standing in between you and sleeping on the streets that night. Like I've right. had people call me and say, I'm trying to get to a shelter in X area, but I only have this amount of money. And I'm like, I there's not necessarily a way for you to get there. Um, so that money piece, that financial aspect is the is sometimes I mean I don't even think it's exaggerating to say life or death like when you say like affordable transportation when it's your when it is your chemotherapy when it is the access to a shelter um it is that money aspect too um and it's and the trips end up being long sometimes right. just long it, as an anthropology major and I'm a sociology major. We love numbers. Yeah. I'm always throwing statistics around in our podcasts, which probably drive some audience crazy. I'm really sorry, but here we sure. go. So the regional mobility plan serves populations which don't have access to reliable transportation. Some numbers of interest that I found in, in uh, the website at, at Morpsey. 6% of our region do not own a car. 14% in our region are considered low income, 13% are 65 and over, 25% are disabled. In our region, that is thousands of people, Mm -hmm. lots of lots and lots of folks. The counties that are included in the mobility plan are very different. We mentioned urban, rural, large cities, small cities, Columbus, London, different needs. Some have major thoroughfares, others may be predominantly two-lane rural roads. Targeted populations also need different types of service and types of transportation. What does the mobility plan strive to accomplish with so many different needs, infrastructures, and priorities? Right. Good so question. I, it is. <laughs> um, and when I saw and when I heard this, I was like, wow, you read the plan. That's so awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's my job. That's what Brett makes me do. It's a lengthy <laughs> document, so I yes. applaud anyone who gets through it. <laughs> She, she went to the TLDR, actually. So. Yeah. I was like, wow, you found the statistics. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so, like as I mentioned earlier, so every mobility manager typically does have their does have their coordinated plan. So, one function of the coordinated plan is that a 5310 provider. So, um, I'm, I'm going to think of an example. So, in Franklin County, have you ever heard of the Dublin Connector? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The Dublin Connector is a 5310 provider. And when you're saying 5310, that's kind of an acronym off of the the governmental fund. Yes. So, board. that okay. is the Enhanced Mobility for Seniors and People with Disabilities Grant. Right. That grant um, is connected to the coordinated plan. So, in order for Dublin Connector to essentially get that money, they have to um, be a part of the regional mobility plan and say, we fall underneath the strategies for improving transportation um, in Franklin County. Therefore, we are a good project for this money. Um, so tell, tell, just mention real quickly yeah. what the Dublin Connector is. So people oh, yeah, understand. Yeah. The Dublin Connector is a, um, it's a transportation service for um, seniors as well as workforce in Dublin, and it's free. Um, so it will pick you up. It's called it's what we call demand response. So demand response um, in our jargony world is um, you either call or you make a appointment online for a vehicle to come pick you up and take you to your destination. Um, demand response is very very popular. People love demand response it's like services. Main, mainstream is demand response. Yes, mainstream is also Mm -hmm. a form of demand response um, transportation. So if you're living in um, Dublin and you are a senior, you have access to this. Um, They contract with a third party um, called Share Mobility that does the transportation. Um, Their vehicles, they have accessible vehicles. So you can, um, if you have a mobility device, you can use it and you can use it within the Dublin area. So it is um, geo. It's bound by the geo uh, by the geo like the geo 
border of Dublin. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have the Hilliard Hilliard has one that's very similar to it's called Hilliard Express. Um, These are all examples of what we commonly refer to as 5310 providers. I'm saying in quotes because that's just the the term that gets thrown around. Mm -hmm. Um, And 5310 providers must be accessible um, and they must prioritize the needs of seniors and individuals with disabilities. They're not necessarily always limited to those populations, but those populations must be served first, essentially, you, according to the federal dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way they connect to the regional mobility plan is that they have to, when they're making their application, say, this is the strategy I fall under. This is how I am improving transportation um, in this region. And then what it does is it encourages these 5310 providers to work together. Um, to share information with each other about how they're getting things done. How are they getting drivers? How's their vehicle maintenance going? Right. Um, what what ba- barriers are they seeing with their seniors, with their populations that they serve? And what the Regional Mobility Plan also does is it, encourage, it encourages collaboration. Um, but going back a little bit, the traditionally, it's one mobility manager, one county, one coordinated plan. Um, and what we're seeing now is a push to go towards the regional plans because, again, people have to go outside of their county. Um, and it's also like a very big administrative burden some, for one person to do a coordinated plan. So what Morpsey is doing is taking on the actual writing of the plan, the updating of the plan, allowing for the mobility managers to focus more on their local goals and then come together for the regional ones, Um, taking off that kind of administrative burden and allowing people to do more of the really important work of getting out in the community. Um, It still still does allow for people to focus on the local needs. So when you look at, so you mentioned Delaware County earlier, Delaware County has moved to um, entirely for their um, transit, Delaware County transit, entirely to demand response. So they do not have what is called a fixed route. So um, in Columbus, we have a fixed route called CODA. So when they, when the bus goes and makes stops at a scheduled time, Delaware County transit has entirely demand response. Um, They have two kinds. I won't go like into all of the weeds. Um, If you live in Delaware County, you should be using um, Delaware County transit or at least try it. Um, And then you have, Licking, and they found that that worked really well for them. They're breaking records all the time in terms of their ridership. I have to try that. You have to. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll try it and then get back on the with the audience and let everybody know what I thought of it. Isn't it yeah. called? Isn't it data? Isn't that the name of it? It's actually now called Delaware County Transit. Okay. Um, so or DCT also because we love acronyms, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so Delaware County Transit. Um, they're now all demand response. They're expanding a lot. Um, yeah, they're expanding their hours. They're just, they're moving really fast. But then you'll see in Licking County, a county that's also growing really quickly, um, has added on fixed route. So they've decided, they're like, you know what, like we have some pretty good density. We have a lot of people that could live within walking distance of, an, of a bus stop. So they've added three fixed routes. Mm-hmm. Um, and they haven't had that in 50 years. Um, that's brand new. And the mobility manager in Licking County is very involved in that. And the mobility manager in Delaware County is very involved in that transit. Um, and it's worked really well. I think they've had, they've had 5,000 rides, um, since they've started on their fixed route in Licking County, 3,000 of those all happening on their main street route. That's the first one that they implemented. Um, and I mean, it's honestly just amazing when you see what these counties are doing, what these mobility managers are accomplishing. And how different, you know, you have one place that said, okay, we're going to have demand response and we're going to add fixed route, which we haven't had in 50 years. Then you have Delaware County Transit saying, actually, this demand response model is working way better for us. And we're having these transit agencies visit each other and share with each other, you know, okay, what, why is this working for you? Could we use maybe the same software to see if that would make things easier okay, we can't use the same software. Why is that? Is that because our budgets are different? Is that because your funding model looks different than mine? Um, And I think that without something like the regional mobility plan, like those conversations don't necessarily always happen. 
because we're so focused on our own agencies. And like, why wouldn't you be right? You want to focus on Mm -hmm. serving your population. Right. You know, Brett, this is why I love having the Morpsy folks come in. Number one, every time someone complains about government is too complicated, nothing happens, we can't get anything done, nobody's getting any services. This is absolutely an incredible example of how government creates change in communities mm-hmm. from, yeah. a, from a state level all the way down to the county, to the individual communities. Having grown up in Columbus, I can remember when CODA, which I think had a different name at that point, had nothing outside their fixed, regular routes, Mm -hmm. and suddenly everything was built at Lockbourne, and they needed to get people down there to work. And suddenly we were having seen buses go down to Lockbourne. And it's, it. I mean, it was the Mm -hmm. first of many really successful, new, creative, innovative Mm -hmm. programs. Yeah, and now they have um, they have Coda Plus too. I live um, in the South Side zone. I'm like the biggest Coda Plus like advocate and nerd. I love using it all the time. Um, but that's also another example of demand response. And Delaware County Transit uses the same software that Coda uses for Coda Plus. Um, they use it's called it's Via software. So if you ever used Uber, mm-hmm. it's the same. Like it like you open the app and it it's like ordering an Uber except for it's with Coda. So it's not nearly the same price as an Uber. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you can watch your vehicle come and pick you up. Um, I just had a presentation um, with uh, Village Connections and I like showed, I was like, okay, like let's do this. Let's get open your app store and download the Coda Plus mm-hmm. app because you live in this zone. Um, and they were like, oh, well I can like go to the book loft and then go back home if it's raining and I won't have to walk. Like that's, those trips, I think, are so important because it's reducing that social isolation. I just wanted a total tangent, but mm-hmm. I just. But, but it's true, especially in communities like German Village, where parking is at a premium. Yeah, it's it's difficult. It's uh, it, it, even if you have trans have a car, it's hard to maneuver through there. It was interesting. There was the um, article in the paper concerning the short north, why people yeah. aren't going to the short north mm-hmm. and the big the big issue was parking. Yeah. I mean, I, I always take, look, I'm a, I'm, I'm a bus person. I like taking the bus, especially up and down high street. It is very, I know, I know that sometimes, so some personal background. So since I'm from North Carolina, I grew up in Greensboro. There's not a lot of public transportation and I, people are kind of blown away where I'm like, look, me moving to Columbus, this is the best public transportation system I've ever like experienced Mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. Like, this to me, and I talk to older adults who sometimes say, you know, I don't want to give up driving because that's my independence. And sometimes I say, well, you know, me moving to Columbus and being able to use public transportation, that expanded my independence because mm-hmm. I'm a very anxious driver. I would never go to the short north if it meant that I had to drive there. <laughs> but if I can walk to High Street, get on a bus and then get up there, even if it takes a little bit longer, that to me is worth it. Um, it's cheaper than the um, parking for sure. I don't have to deal with making any decisions on the road. I can get out a book. I can just kind of enjoy my ride. I get to see, like, really, like, take in the sights and, like, enjoy downtown. Right. Um, like, that to me is independence and being able to, like, know that I have that option. Um, so, yeah, it's been it's been very, very interesting. Well, I, I spent a year in Detroit as an undergraduate um, doing my internship program and loved the transportation that was going on there and was which was limited, but I used public transportation all the time and then did an internship in Washington. So I was on the subway all the time. So I came back to Columbus thinking we need a subway and a train. <laughs> I'm still asking for that subway and the train, but we're getting closer. So it's okay. <laughs> there are programs in Ohio and around the country that have tackled the, uh, these issues successfully. And we just talked about some on a local level per se. So b- those that are successful programs around the country and around Ohio outside of, you know, uh, our region six, um, are they included or being talked about in future plans? Yeah, I think that we always have an eye on what's happening um, in other states. Um, I know that because we do have a national um, mobility management um, network, there's this thing called the National Center for Mobility Management, um, and that's where we get a lot of our webinars and get a lot of our networking. Mm -hmm. um, And we're 
just again, very lucky to have that. Um, we're working, we also see a lot of happening in other regions. Um, so for example, um, we see in Perry County, there's a mobility manager that runs an entire call center out of a JFS, a Jobs wow. and Family Services. Um, okay. I know we have to tell all the new mobility manager, like nobody's expecting you to run an entire call center. <laughs> there's oh, not just one way to do things. Yeah. But we're seeing kind of more creative ways to go about things and looking and talking to each other. We're like, okay, how did you, the number one question is always like, how did you fund it? Um, and then after the, how did you fund it? How did you um, make it operational? We see in other counties, um, mobility managers working with their CO AAAs and centralizing transportation in that way. Using not their CO AAAs, but their AAAs. Mm-hmm. We see mobility managers working with their area agencies on aging. Um, to actually have them contract out the transportation because they already have all those cross-county connections. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we're seeing. Um, Well, the one thing in Perry County, that's kind of interesting. Job and Family Services offices have tended to be fairly strong in the counties. Mm -hmm. They've been around for a long time. They're um, part of the community. People know what they are. The fact that you can run... Um, that that you need to run a call center, that it looks like a great opportunity to make it happen. Yeah, because that that agency all already exists, which kind of goes back to that notion of you need an agency to house the mobility manager. So mm-hmm. really, our county government is playing some really important roles here that people may not realize. Yes. Um, and the county commissioners are typically the ones that are also like signing off on these goals and strategies and have strong relationships with their mobility managers. And that's what the mobility manager is supposed to do. It's supposed Mm -hmm. to have a relationship with their local elected officials, with those county commissioners and say, you know, maybe they're providing anecdotes or maybe they're providing the results from their surveys and saying like, this is what we're seeing and what we're need, what we're needing. Um, And having a um, agency like a um, area agency on aging or a regional council like MORPSI or a jobs and family services, an agency that has, the resources to uplift that project is mm-hmm. very vital um, because nobody can do their job entirely alone. Right. Um, right. You need to have that supportive infrastructure. And sometimes it helps to have just that legitimacy as an agency kind of backing you up. Mm-hmm. And and in turn, they have those agencies have the mobility managers who have the information mm-hmm. and data at hand. Yeah. Mobility managers are kind of like this. They when I started, I really I was talking to one mobility manager and I was like, do you just know everybody? She was like, yes, I've been here for nine years. Like, that's like what I'm supposed to do is just know everybody. Like, I might not know all the answers, but I will find the person who knows the answer for exactly. you. That exactly. is my job is to like have that to make connections and get the right people in the room to have the conversation. Mm-hmm. So, um, Emma, when you and I were talking a little before the um making some decisions about our podcast, there were a lot of other programs that you wanted to to also mention. Morpsy has this very interesting position within our community as a nonprofit agency, yeah. but also just all the information is there in one place. And so we were, we're depending on Morpsy for a lot of information. Um, but you mentioned a few of the programs that you wanted to elaborate on. People may not realize that there's a weatherization and home repair program or air quality program. So why don't you tell us a little bit about all those other great projects going on? Yes. Um, I feel like I'm at like a tabling event. I like to go to those um, <laughs> a lot because when I first started Morpsy, it was such an easy way to learn about what we offered is to be like telling people over and over again about these. So I'll give my spiel. Um <laughs> So for um, Morpsy offers home energy efficiency and safety services for residents at no cost um, if they have a qualifying income. Um, so check out Morpsy's website to see if your income qualifies. Um, but this will keep your home warm in the winter, cooler in the summer, um, and also reduce energy bills. Like we've, that is one of the main goals to reduce people's energy bills and ultimately keep people in their homes too, right? Right. Um, that would be something that I would see a lot come up in my eviction foreclosure work would be a skyrocketing utility bills. Um, and yeah, so that, call the website and talk about your options. And if you don't qualify, you might know somebody who does. Um, so please check those out. And, and don't self-select yourself out. Seniors tend to do this. They say, oh, I probably, you know, my social security is probably too high. Don't, 
take yourself out of the the loop until you really look into it Mm -hmm. and talk to somebody if you've got questions because that's what the Morpsey staff are there to do is to answer those kinds of questions. So um, audience, don't forget um, that this is all there for you to take advantage of. Yes, I love that disclaimer. Actually, I want to. We'll put. I wish we could put. We should put that like a banner. It's like, do not self select yourself out. Exactly. It, just try it. Just see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Morpsey also monitors the air quality in Central Ohio. And mm-hmm. you, you guys can, put out the notices, right? Yes, and you can sign up to get um, notices to your phone. I signed up for these. They were very helpful. Like during the. Um, Canada wildfires, mm-hmm. um, getting a text message that's like, hey, it's un, um, it's unhealthy for sensitive groups. Stay inside. Um, it's just, I, I consider it a very vital, I'm like, if you live in central Ohio, you need to sign up to make sure that you're taking care of yourself and taking care of your health. Um, and you can also sign up. And this is basically like a big plug for a website. You have to go on our website and sign up for it. <laughs> um, and then um, we also have uh, Go Ohio Commute. This is for our, um, I know you guys talk a lot about employment, um, and so if you're looking for a carpool partner, go to gohiocommute.com. You can put in your um, commute, and it will set you up. It will kind of show you other um, commuters in your area, and you can set up your own carpool. Carpooling is great because then you will help keep our air quality clean um, and also save money. And you can sign up for, if you log your trips, they're do, they do a lot of um challenges like make your miles matter challenges they give out a lot of gift cards oh cool they're very um and it's kind of it's just a fun thing to do with your friends i know that people carpool already so it's like why would you not just already log the trip and get all of the fun credit for it right i mean commuting is terrible and it's boring and it's aggravating and if you at least have some friends in the car with you it's goes it's shorter even though it's not it seems like it Yes, and we have um, an emergency ride home program with that Go Ohio commute. So let's say that like you two were able, were you two carpooled here today, um, and you were signed up for the program and you logged all of your trips. You get four emergency ride home. So let's say like you guys carpool here today. One of you has to leave early for an emergency and leave the other one here. The one who's left here could call any provider of their choice: Uber, Lyft, a taxi company, um, and then get reimbursed for that ride. Um, you would submit your, there's a process online, um, submit your receipt, and then within four um, weeks, receive a check in the mail for four emergency home rides. For a year? For a year, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody should sign up. And if it's also if you if you bike or if you walk or if you take the bus. So essentially those green commutes that you're taking. So audience, we're throwing a lot of stuff and a lot of programs and a lot of resources out to you. Don't forget to check our show notes and you'll have our resources sheet with all of this information about Morpsey and all of its programs. Actually, right. one more thing. Okay. And this Hold one's me. and this one I is very cool and kind of new. So this one's Gohio Mobility. Right. That's a page on the Gohio commute site. And so if you're looking for transportation that isn't driving, you need accessible transportation, go on the site and you can put in your address like where you're well you're where you're starting your trip from and then your um your accessibility needs. So let's say you have um, you can click like I have a, I need something with wheelchair lift. I need something that with service animal accommodations um, and then click search. It will generate a list of options. And then if you need more help, click find a mobility manager, type in whatever county you're in. If you're in Franklin County, lo and behold, it'll be my name. And then you can call me <laughs> and I'll help you find um, a ride that works. Does that work yeah. for say someone was maybe not an older adult or disabled on a permanent basis, mm-hmm. but maybe you know they broke their leg? And they oh got, yeah. So it so it it could be audience. This is a resource that you might need just for a short period of time, yeah. not forever, but it's there for you to get to your doctor's appointments or wherever you need to go. And I would say look at it, and this this is something that. Um, you know, I, is so important. Look at it now because I think that something that we're hearing all the time is like people don't make that emergency plan until after it's an emergency. So like we all think, not all of us, but a lot of us think like we can just get up, get in our cars and go every day. Mm-hmm. And we're not making the plan for the day that we can't. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to age, we know that we're going to need to get around for at least 10 years after we stop driving. That's 10 years of like social events, doctor's appointments, 
um, that you still need to be getting to. Mm -hmm. And then it's not just for older adults, I think is also, it's also, it's intergenerational. It's for anyone as young as like 16. Like you have to be thinking about your alternatives because otherwise like you don't want to be in the position of using the bus for the very first time when you're already stressed out because you have somewhere you need to get to right now. Practice it right now. Um, because we want, I think that that's another point, a huge point of the regional mobility plan, as well as MORPC's other um, initiatives um, that we're working on, um, is we want people to have a menu of options. We want people to be able to get up and get up one morning and go, okay, do I want to bike or walk or take the bus or drive? I, I don't want it to, I don't think that, I think that seniors, as well as anybody in our community deserves the opportunity to wake up and like have that full autonomy. But we're not going to get there if we don't understand the importance of this transportation mm-hmm. and also start practicing the, um, the options that we do have. You know, Brett, mm-hmm. this is why we bring experts into our podcast, because every expert we bring in always says plan. Yeah. Plan, yeah. research, be prepared. Sure. Regardless of what the topic yeah, is. That's true. <laughs> so very cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we've talked about um, today, uh, our discussions looked at major innovations for Central Ohio's transportation plans. However, it's not an easy or fast process. Um, what are considered the greatest challenges or barriers to that success that you want to happen or, or it's already happened, actually? Um, uh, is it funding? technology, uh, vehicle development, other issues, uh, or maybe all? I really wish that there was just one and that I could just be like, and now we're done because it's just this one thing. (laughs) Um, But um, there's a lot, right? Like I think that um, some of the ones that are are, uh, called out in the regional mobility plan itself is siloed funding. So like when we have all of these, when we have agencies competing for funding, when we have like restrictions on on what funding you can apply for and applying for funding and finding funding takes away time that could be used doing the work (laughs) too. Um, And I think like, just like the umbrella of like capacity, like I just want to make that like capacity is like the magical like word and social services. Like, do you have capacity of drivers? Do you have vehicles? Um, We've gone through a lot with um, vehicle shortages Um, especially with those um, accessible vehicles. And then the cost went up recently by a lot. Um, you know, just like how you saw your personal vehicles get more expensive. The sa- it was not like isolated to just that. It was also mm-hmm. um, public transportation vehicles sure. as well. Um, but then also like um, some of the goals that are identified in the regional mobility plan are encouraging stakeholder support for transit and encouraging awareness of options too. Um, because like I like we just talked about, like that idea of um, individuals knowing what their options are and being able to use them and also understanding that they're for them. Like public transportation isn't just for one specific population. It is for everybody. Um, and yeah, it's just it's not a guarantee that we're going to be able to use one mode of transportation forever. Um, and I think that if we had more people, Um, think about that long term we could have more people also involved and I would like to see more people involved in the planning process and more involved in um, knowing their options and giving their feedback to MORPSI and kind of being um, working with us to like help um, us prepare for growth Um, and I'm a social worker so I'm also going to be like very strengths-based You know, like when we're looking at barriers, I don't want it to just be like, these are all of the challenges and oh, it's so scary. Like growth is also an incredible strength. Like we have a lot going for us Um, and we're growing in terms of like people moving here. Like I am one of those when people talk about like, oh, like so many people are moving here for jobs. I'm like, that's me. (laughs) I am that demographic of people that's moving to Columbus. But at the same time, we have people um, aging in Central Ohio. Central Ohio is also going to have a growing aging population. And instead of like thinking of it as like the scary thing, I think we need to be thinking of it as this um, like benefit and this real strength that we're going to have. They used to call it like the silver tsunami. I don't know if you guys heard that. I, I, ne- oh, yeah. I never liked that because tsunamis are destructive. Yes. And now I think they're calling it like the silver wave because you can ride, you can surf a wave, you can ride a wave. I like that better. And like a yes. wave is like peaceful. Yes. It's like on a beach. Like we love waves. Exactly. Um, so, exactly. you know, we can ride the silver wave yeah. as Central Ohio. But, you know, and, and this is another shout out to our buddy Fran Ryan, who mm-hmm. taught us all in the aging space that if it's good for an older person, it's good for mm-hmm. a younger person. 
that works for an older person, it's going to work for that mom with a baby carriage. It, it yeah. just it it's not we're not looking at issues that only affect one part of the population. And I think that's why I like working in the senior space so much is the way that intersects with pretty much every single mm-hmm. other aspect of identity. Um getting like aging is something hopefully we're all going to do age friendly has this button say like aging is so cool everyone's doing it exactly (laughs) you know so yeah i mean that's i think the great benefit of working and being in this space right my gosh so i say this every time our time goes too quickly and um thank you this has been a phenomenal discussion um we didn't talk about trains which i usually used (laughs) to just Bug the heck out of everybody about I know. trains. We could talk about bus rapid transit if you wanted to, too. No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about a train to Chicago. Um, but next time, next time yeah. we'll, we'll have somebody from Warpsy talking about trains. Um, Emma, we always ask our guests for sort of their last words of wisdom. Is there anything we haven't talked about you want to make sure gets out there or just a reminder to everybody? I mean, so one of the things I want to talk about the planning again, because it's just been so much. It's just front of my mind right now. Um, Morpsy does have these my mobility plans that you can fill out. This was a need identified by our community, the Franklin County Mobility Advisory Committee. I call it the FICMAC um, or the Big Mac. Um, it's full of a lot of our local experts. And we came up with this um, way for you to plan your mobility Um, either as you age or for your emergencies. Um, You can download it from the website, fill it out, um, and start to think about it. And also practice. Like, if you're scared to use the CODA bus, practice with a friend. If you've never, um, even if, like, your alternative plan is, like, asking, like, a family member to drive you, practice making that phone call. Like, as, as, like, weird as that might sound, like, Practice asking for help, like practice using if your backup plan is biking, practice the bike trip, even when you don't have to. You Mm -hmm. never want the first time you do something to be when you're in a panic. You want it to be. And behavior change is like not an overnight thing. It's gradual. Mm -hmm. It's building habits. Um, So, yeah, get out and and try something new, um, whether whatever it is. Many thanks to our expert guest, Emma Strange, mobility coordinator, for the Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission, listeners, thank you for listening, joining us, uh, and and you know don't forget to check our website for show notes, for contact information, and the resources that we discussed today. You can find all of that at LookingForwardOurWay.com. <laughs>